It's not even just about the litigation that could come after the election. There is already active litigation underway. More than 160 lawsuits have been filed ahead of the vote. How should we be considering those cases? I think those cases are just to lay a groundwork. I think they're a public relations effort uh, by the Trump campaign to lay a groundwork for their argument that this there's somehow voter irregularity or it's rigged or it's unfair and they want to just say look we've been raising these issues all the time and their confirmation is that they're going to lose so they want to lay a groundwork if that happens to say that it was rigged um, because there's really no other reason to do this you you don't file a lawsuit before it happens it's like if you get hit by a car you can file a lawsuit but mm. you don't go to the intersection before you're hit and say i'm gonna I'm going to file a lawsuit before I get hit because there might be voter irregularities or something. It's the same thing. And they're just raising this as a public publicity issue. Well, some Democratic organizations have Democratic Party, that is, organizations or affiliated organizations have filed suits uh, ahead of the vote as well. How should we think about the differences in the cases Republicans are bringing versus Democrats? Well, as your prior guest noted, there's always a little bit of this going on every election cycle. But predominantly, those Democratic lawsuits have been in response to Republican, and I should say, to be fair, mega Republican changes on local electoral boards and county recorder offices that are designed to kind of limit the vote and to disenfranchise people. So the Democratic arguments are much more specific to things that the MAGA Republicans are doing. The MAGA Republicans are just throwing things out. There's nothing new that happens that causes the MAGA lawsuits. Most, although not all, but most of the Democratic lawsuits are in response to changes that are occurring. For instance, what happened in North Carolina, where the local commission wanted to change all the rules, and the judge says they don't have those powers to do so. One of the cases that we were watching just today that made some news is in Virginia, where a judge ruled that a voter purge was happening too close to the election, and all of those voters that had been purged from uh, the rolls should be placed back uh, on them as registered voters. Donald Trump called this unconstitutional. Here's how he reacted to this ruling. The outrageous decision goes against the very bedrock of our democracy, and thankfully, Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin, who's doing a terrific job, is working hard to uh, fix this problem. Robert Youngkin says he will appeal this, take it to the Supreme Court if necessary, and it does raise the question of whether any of these cases are going to be solved at a at a reasonable timeline, if they're just getting appealed and appealed and appealed all the way up potentially to the highest court in the land in some instances. Well, the, there's a thing called the Purnell Doctrine that basically says, look, don't go messing around too much with voter rolls this close to the election, because what you do is you disenfranchise people who should not be disenfranchised, and you don't have time for any valid mechanism to kind of correct those problems. That's why you want to do these, if you really believe there's an issue with the voter rolls, you do it in, let's say, an off year when um, there's no election pending. And... To say that this is somehow outrageous or unconstitutional, this has been the practice for decades and decades in America, and it's been the basis of fair elections where Democrats or Republicans have won, and nobody has complained because there's no reason to complain. So let's talk about the complaints that could come after the vote once we have results in hand potentially or maybe even uh, before we have final calls. What is the easiest recourse if someone wants to argue against the results to pursue that case in court? What do you expect will be the arguments we will hear? Well, it's going to depend on which state they come from, because, you know, different states have different rules. But eventually, in a federal election, you could up end up in federal court. Now, what you're going to see is, I think, any time there's an innocent problem or a mistake that happens, it's going to be blown out of, out of proportion in only those districts where Donald Trump loses. If there's irregularities in districts where Donald Trump wins— you're not going to hear about any lawsuits from the MAGA Republicans or from Donald Trump. It's only going to be selective, and it's only going to be related to him. So, for instance, let's say a printer breaks down, or somehow it causes a smudge on a ballot, or even, God forbid, a hanging chad someplace. Those are going to be made in, and blown into bigger issues than they really are, and it's going to be rife with all kinds of conspiracy theories that will support this. 
And what the real damage is, is, is I think, two things. One is it's a real damage to our faith in the election, and that's the point. Uh, Donald Trump has said it's only going to be fair if he wins. Well, that's just demonstrably wrong. Uh, the other damage, quite frankly, is you, you do realize all these lawsuits cost the taxpayer hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's court time, it's staff time, it's judges time, it's time to defend from county officials or state officials. That ends up on the taxpayer's bill. And of course, Donald Trump doesn't give a hoot about that at all. He only cares about whether he wins or not. Well, and he has tried this before. We all know what happened in 2020. No court substantiated his claims that the election was rigged or that Joe Biden didn't, in fact, win it, which he did. Do you expect this could ultimately, though, end up differently than the case was in, in 2020? What could what could happen differently in 2024? Well, I think there could be two things. Uh, number one, there were 64 different cases, and he lost all 64. Only one went to the next level, so it's 63, but he eventually lost that one, too. Um, what could be different here it's, it is going to be the margins. If Kamala Harris has a much more substantial victory, Donald Trump's going to have much less to complain about, because you can't keep arguing every place is somehow wrong. Um, so if the margins are close, you're going to see much more come out of the MAGA Republicans than otherwise. If the margins are much broader in favor of Kamala Harris, then um, then you're going to see a lot more litigation. And of course, if Kamala Harris loses, I would expect that on election night, she will concede the race in a dignified way, according to American history. And that will be it. And we'll be dealing with a second Trump term. Well, as we consider then what the ultimate outcome of this election could be and the implications it could have, Robert, as a constitutional lawyer, what concerns you most? What concerns me most are the kind of erosions of democratic norms and the values that the Constitution enshrines. What a lot of these lawsuits are doing, and basically, again, the mega Republican lawsuits are doing, is kind of a strategy of disenfranchisement. And it's dealing with arguments that are pure fiction. Uh, the idea that illegal aliens are voting in U.S. election is a pure fiction. I suppose you could find one or two someplace who have done it. But to have any effect on an election, persons without papers in this country don't want to go on anybody's radar. They don't want to go vote. Um, and I think it's that erosion. The fact that we have a candidate that's not willing to accept defeat honorably is a break from the norms of our democracy, going all the way back to George Washington, who decided to step down after two terms, and then John Adams after he was defeated by, by Thomas Jefferson, dignified, left the, left the White House. And that's what our American tradition has been. And this is a real rupture of that tradition.